Okay, I see the YouTube live. Now, sergeants, you may start your recordings. You see recording done. Thank you. Cloud is started. Thank you. Backup is started. Thank you. You may begin with the opening. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Dispositions. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video? Once again, would all panelists please turn on your video? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Adrian Adams, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings, and Dispositions. I'm joined remotely today by Council Members Ku, Miller, Tragen, Traeger, and Constantinides. Today, we will be voting on LU 691, the site selection of a new Department of Sanitation garage. We will also hold a public hearing on the DeKalb Commons UDAP in Brooklyn. Before we begin, I recognize the subcommittee council to review today's hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Adams. I am Angelina Martinez Rubio, counsel to the subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. If you're a member of the public who wants to watch this hearing, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are recognized by the chair to testify. When the chair recognizes you, your mic will be unmuted. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, you can email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands. Chair Adams will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Council members may have questions, um, so she'll ask you to stay on. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask that you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Adams will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Councillor. We will now vote to approve LU 691, the site selection for the DSNY Queen Sanitation Garage 1, which the subcommittee heard on November 5th. This application was submitted by the Department of Sanitation and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to Section 197C of the Charter for the site selection and acquisition of property for a sanitation garage and salt shed facility to be located at 31 11. 20th Avenue and 19th Avenue in Queens Community District 1 in the council district represented by council member Constantinides. The site selection would replace an existing DSNY facility located in council member Van Bramer's district. At the November 5th hearing, the council members expressed their desire that, ex that the existing DSNY site be used for affordable housing. Since that hearing, HPD has issued the following commitment, quote, HPD is committed to providing 100% affordable housing at this site and will solicit affordable housing options to this end with the proviso that in order to do this, we will need to work with our partner agencies such as DSNY to assess the physical attributes of the site to account for any impacts toward future development. I now recognize council member Constantinides to offer remarks on this project. 
Thank you, Councilmember Adams, and thank you for your leadership of this committee. And I appreciate the opportunity to be very brief in my remarks today. But uh, this, although this garage is in uh, Councilmember Bramer's district, it is a cross the street from my district. Uh, and he and I both share uh, the uh, the desire that this had to be moved. Uh, this is an environmental hazard, an environmental justice issue. This site has been next to the Ravenswood houses for 50 plus years. It has been long past time to remove this garage from its current site and site it somewhere more appropriately within Community District 1. Uh, this today does that. Uh, it does several things. One, it moves the garage into an industrial area where the trucks will stay and be able to pick up the trash in Community District 1, plow our streets, stay in our neighborhood with a sustainable solar voltaic garage that's going to have sustainability features that young people from our neighborhood can come and learn about when we are able to do those types of things again with field trips. Uh, we're going to have a traffic study on 21st Street conducted by DOT to reimagine the street for the potential for busways and other opportunities to make our transportation network more robust in Western Queens. It's going to ensure, uh, most importantly, that the current site next to public housing does not become luxury development, does not become some another environmental justice hazard but an RFP led by the community with community input from the local CLT and the Ravenswood Tenants Association that will be 100% affordable. This is a legacy we leave behind by this vote today. And I'm proud to be working with my colleagues. Uh, they talked about Councilmember Van Bramer and this committee, uh, Chair Adams and the rest of my colleagues to ensure that this garage, when it's moved, we move the right way and ensure a sustainable So thank you. Thank you very much, council member. We've also been joined by council members Barron and Cornegy. Council, please call the roll. Subcommittee will now vote to approve LU 691. Um, Chair Adams. I vote aye. Council member Koo. Aye. Council Member Barron. Can we unmute Council Member Barron? Um, I will call in then Council Member Miller. Uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. On behalf of my family from the Ravenswood Houses, I proudly uh, vote aye. Thank you. And Council Member Traeger? I vote aye. And let's go back to Council Member Barron. Thank you. I vote aye. Uh, by a vote of five in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions, the item will be recommended for the full land use committee for approval. Thank you, Councillor. We'll now move on to today's public hearing on the pre-considered LU relating to application number C200155HAK, the DeKalb Commons Project. Submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and 197-C of the New York City Charter, the application requests the designation of an urban development action area the approval of an urban development action area project for such area and the approval of the disposition of city owned property to a developer selected by HPD for property located at 633 through 639 DeKalb Avenue, 648 through 654 DeKalb Avenue and 1187 Fulton Street in the district represented by council member Carnegie in Brooklyn. These requested actions would facilitate the construction of three residential developments containing approximately 84 affordable rental units and 1,470 square feet of commercial space, which would be developed under HPD's extremely low and low income affordability program, also known as ELLA or ELLA. We now offer the opportunity for Council Member Carnegie to make any remarks if he wishes to do so. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Adams. It's always great to see you. Um, this is a project that uh, I'm conflicted about, and I'm conflicted about it because not because of the affordability. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us to get affordability in an uh, everly changing, an ever changing district uh, where affordability is a serious concern. Um, however, um, the project had been under the purview for two decades of Eddie Freeman and the Freeman family. And up until late last night, we were trying to come up with a way to uh, honor the family's commitment to the community and have the city really stand up for our small businesses. This particular business today, as a matter of fact, celebrates its 41st anniversary of doing business in the Bedford-Stuyvesant community, has been a, a, an anchor for everything from presidential runs to um, just a meeting place. And the fact that the city has over a period of time, most recently removed all of the parking spaces around the area and rendered that business almost unable to do business. Um, and as we try to move forward, um, they shouldn't be competing ideas. It shouldn't be competing affordability that crushes small business. It shouldn't be that they're mutually exclusive. It shouldn't be that the nonprofit provider of the development sits you know, in the middle of a, a, a war potentially between small business owners and the city of New York. We came to a conclusion last night that we would look uh, ardently to try to find um, ancillary parking space. And there was a commitment from the city to do that. Um, so I'm optimistic, I'm cautiously optimistic that we can remedy what this family needs by providing for them and other businesses in the immediate area the aid that they need in a critical time by not removing parking spaces so that they, you know, people that are that want to patronize their business are able to park in close vicinity. That impact and studies will show that during this particular time, in, you know, right now in history, that we should be doing everything we can to undergird, especially our legacy businesses. So I am cautiously optimistic about this project. I am asking or demanding that the city honor its commitment to try and make the family whole by their the, the, the most meager ask that they have, which is a, a provision of, uh, of um, parking in the immediate vicinity ancillary to that business that has been a stalwart in our community for decades, four decades and one year. Um, so that's, that's my take on this. These should not be competing ideas. We should not get one thing and lose another. So we should not be competing over whether or not we'll have affordable housing units for the hardworking families in the community juxtaposed to supporting businesses. And this is one of those times when it's really painful for me to watch us make a decision and have as a member and as a body to determine whether or not we're gonna support a project that gives affordable housing um, in an ever changing district, what I call the epicenter of gentrification, while, you know, potentially uh, negatively impacting on businesses in the community in this particular instance, the Freeman family. So thank you for being able, allowing me time and not having me on the clock because I know I would have gone way over time. But I've been passionate about this. We've been working on this for years. And just to, just while we seem like we're going to get uh, some progress on affordability residentially, you know, we, we're needing a small business potentially in the groin. We can do better as a city. We can be more thoughtful. We can look at uh, uh, everything that's necessary to, to undergird our communities. This is a black business. We said we're going to commit to uh, supporting black businesses. And in this way, they're making us choose between affordable housing and supporting a business. And, you know, that, that, that's not the way we should be doing business as a city. We, we are more thoughtful. We have more people in place from a land use perspective that we should be able to come across. So we were on the phone last night uh, with, with land use. Um, and we got commitments from the city to at least try really, really hard. So I'm cautiously optimistic about this project. Thank you so much, Councilmember Cornegie. I share uh, I share your optimism um, and certainly your passion when it comes to uh, black businesses in our in our communities. Goodness knows we don't need to do anything uh, to their detriment. So thank you very much. All right, Council, please call the applicant panel. Um, the applicant panel for this item is Sarah Mallory, Ling Zeng, Philip Hoffman, Gordon Bell, Brian Halusen, and Frank Lang. So can we admit them? I'm not mute them, please.
Um, Chair, can I proceed and administer the affirmation? Yes, please administer the affirmation. Thank you, Council. Um, panelists, can you please raise your right hands and state your names? Frank Lang. Lindsay. Philip Hoffman. Sarah Mallory. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? I do. I, I, do. I do. I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record prior to your speaking and you may begin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Mallory and I'm the Executive Director for Government Affairs at HPD. And before I read my testimony, I just want to give a quick thanks to Councilmember Cornegy for those uh, opening comments. There is a long history at this site and I want to say that the development team and the city are committed to continuing engagement with your office as we seek to advance this project. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Pre-considered land use item that we're hearing today consists of a ULERP action seeking UDAP area designation, project and disposition approval for a project known as DeKalb Commons for three vacant city owned sites. This item is related to the application for DeKalb Commons located at 633-639 DeKalb Avenue, block 1774, lots 74, 75, 76, and 77. 648, 654 DeKalb Avenue, block 1779, lots 22, 24, 26. 1187 Fulton Street, block 2000, lot 43, and Brooklyn Council District number 36. The sponsors, St. Nick's Alliance and bed Restoration, were selected through a competitive process, and their proposal is to construct three residential buildings under HPD's Extremely Low and Low Income Affordability Program, also called ELLA. Under the ELLA program, sponsors purchase city-owned or privately-owned land or vacant buildings and construct multifamily buildings in order to create affordable rental housing. These newly constructed buildings provide rental housing to low-income families with a range of incomes from 40% to 80% of the AMI, or area median income. Projects may include tiers of units with rents affordable to households earning up to 100% of AMI and subject to project underwriting, up to 30% of the units may be rented to formerly homeless families and individuals. The proposed development today will consist of three newly constructed residential buildings with approximately 84 affordable units, plus one unit for the super and ground floor commercial space at 1187 Fulton Street. The buildings will have a mix of unit types and income tiers include 0% for formerly homeless individuals, 40%, 50%, 70%, and 80% of AMI. And rents will range from up to $215 for a studio at the lowest AMI tier to approximately $2,000 for a three bedroom unit at the highest AMI tier. The project consists of three separate buildings. Two of the sites located on DeKalb Avenue are seven story elevator buildings with rear outdoor areas and both buildings seek Passive House Institute US requirements, making these buildings energy efficient. The other property on Fulton Street will be developed as a four-story walk-up and will have three residential apartments and a ground floor commercial space. Today, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of the DeKalb Commons ELLA project in order to facilitate construction of this affordable residential building. Thank you for uh, the time to testify today. Thank you. Is anyone else speaking? Um, is there somebody who's going through the slides? Yeah, I think the development team can walk through the slides. That would be great. Yes, uh, Philip will, will kick it off and, and I think Gordon would also be um, joining during the presentation. Philip? Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry, I, was, I just got unmuted now. Yes. Uh, I think um, HPD um, kind of um, outlined the first couple of slides so we can um, you know, move ahead to slide number three, which will uh, give a little bit more. So 
Again, hello, my name is Philip Hoffman, project manager at St. Nick's Alliance and partner with Bed St Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation for the development of the DeKalb Commons project. The first site of our project is 633-639 DeKalb Avenue, which is located north of DeKalb Avenue between Nostrand and Marcy Avenues. The site is near public transportation, schools, playgrounds, a community garden, the Kosciuszko Pool, supermarkets, and other local businesses. 633-639 DeKalb Avenue is a seven-story uh, um, elevator building, including a mix of studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units for a total of 37 units. The building will include a laundry room and a rear children's play area and sitting area. The building will be designed by architect Magnuson Architecture and Planning to passive house principles, including solar panels, high performance building envelope and ventilation, and energy efficient mechanical systems. There are several benefits that this passive house design could provide to the tenants, including better indoor air quality, reduced indoor noise pollution, and lower utility bills due to its airtight design and extreme insulation. The passive house design may also have a role in controlling the spread of viruses due to its required ventilation and filtration performance goals. Due to the design, the project has been approved up to tier three incentives through the NYSERDA multifamily new construction program. And the project has also submitted for NYSERDA Buildings of Excellence grant that would assist in further sustainable, sustainability measures. Next slide, oh. Next slide, please. 648, 654 DeKalb Avenue is located south of DeKalb Avenue, adjacent to the Kosciuszko Pool and across the street from Site 1. Um, next slide, please. The building is a seven-story elevator building, including a mix of studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units for a total of 45 units. This building will include a laundry room and children play area and sitting area. This building also includes a community room to be shared by both of DeKalb buildings. Design, the design is similar to site one, designed to passive house principles. Next slide, please. Our third site, 1187 Fulton Street is located between Spencer Place and Bedford Avenue and is within walking distance of Community Board 3 and our partners at Restoration. The site is near multiple schools, playgrounds, the Brooklyn Children's Museum, supermarkets, and other local businesses. Next slide, please. 1187 Fulton Street is a four-story walk-up including three two-bedroom units and a retail space on the ground floor. The building will be designed as an energy efficient building, including efficient appliances, lighting, and mechanical equipment. Next slide, please. In summary, DeKalb Commons is a three building project that includes 84 residential units, a supers unit, and retail space with a mix of studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. More than 50% of these units are designated for families. Next slide, please. The project will serve low-income households earning 30% to 80% of the area median income, including units designated for formerly homeless persons. You can see here a chart of projected incomes and rents. I would now like to invite our partner, Gordon Bell, from bed Restoration Corporation to speak. Next slide, next slide please. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, subcommittee. It's Gordon Bell, and I, I will tell the truth as I always do. You know, it's a fascinating and important thing that Rob, uh, Councilman Cornegie, and, and this deal team in the city were meeting last night because Restoration also had its gala last night, 52 years of existence serving the residents of New York City and mostly in Brooklyn. St. Nick's also has an illustrious and long history. We've, we've developed over 2,000 units of housing and restoration. St. Nick's has developed over 2,600. Um, and last year we purchased uh, with our partners that monster deal, uh, the Brooklyn Mega Bundle. So 2,600 units of NYCHA housing and NYCHA RAD. We are working hard to provide not only rebuilding the physical infrastructure, but putting in place the supports that help people live better lives today. And it's my great honor to be executive vice president of restoration 
I got to say, we are committed to this project for a lot of reasons. But as we look at bed today and what it's going through, we see 48% of the population that was African-American, that 48% has gone. We look at black businesses being absolutely destroyed and decimated. We recognize that the lack of know-how capital connection in this very disruptive period of, of COVID pandemic has rendered a lot of business as usual not functioning. And we have a real concern for both the people and the physicality of Brooklyn, and we are trying to serve all of it. It's a real false choice to think that you can either choose this project or to support the Freeman family. And I think Councilman Rob and uh, President Eric understand that. They love the affordable housing. They love that we're passive house. And Frank Lang and his team have, and Philip have really pushed hard to be on the real edge of quality, of giving people a fantastic place to live. And in this, this one project, one piece of the project on Fulton Street, we're gonna have the classic residences over retail. And that retail needs to be a vital part of our community again. Right now, no one is in the foot traffic the way they used to be. And we need to have people milling about being together as part of a community in healthier times. Um, the two other pieces on DeKalb Avenue, they define the neighborhood. Two buildings defining a neighborhood with common space, outdoor space. We care so much about this project. We got into discussions with Community Board 3. We even did a shadow study to understand the impact on the Kosciuszko pool. And we understand that we need to be, to be developing responsibly. So I want to say Restoration and St. Nick's have pushed for these sorts of developments and we've been on the leading edge for a long while and we stand ready to deliver a top quality project with the close partnership of HPD and make affordable ha housing happening. If you notice really carefully, the rent structure, $500 and change to 2000. This is one of those few projects that's an affordable housing that really will reach the entire community, the formerly homeless, all the way to folks at 80% AMI. So many of our important projects don't do that. They focus on the higher end. We are really pleased to bring this project before you today. We love the support and the understanding that we support not only the physicality, but the folks, the people, and the businesses of the Brooklyn community. And we're prepared to continue to work toward finding solutions. Councilman Rob mentioned, we'll have a post-Thanksgiving meeting, another follow-up to help identify parking solutions. And we are committed to helping develop, if we're allowed to have that opportunity, those parking solutions. And we have some really great ideas and some good contacts. We just need the opportunity to keep this project at pace and then to join in with Rob and the rest of the folks in the area to figure out the parking solutions that are, that we, that are within reach. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else uh, prepared to testify on this project? We're, we're here to answer questions. Okay, uh, I'm, I've got a question before I go to my colleagues. Um, I know that uh, the parking uh, seems to be an issue um, uh, with the free how many parking spaces are we speaking about? I don't think I, I heard a number. The history is that this restaurant owned by the Freeman family that has multiple enterprises, they have a restaurant, a catering hall, and a lounge. They serve as a hub for many hours of the day, the evening and the day period, as well as weekends and special events. They have rented for about 20 years, 631, the parcel under mm -hmm. cap. Now, all this happened well before St. Nick's and restoration got involved. We're involved in what, Frank, 2018 or so, 2017, 18, answering the question from HPD, would you like to propose affordable housing? Before that, years before that, there was a disagreement with the Freeman family about the disposition of the property. So we joined this long after this has been settled in court. Despite that, the deal team cares about trying to be of service in this regard with parking. But 631 is a parcel that probably had, since it's a full parcel, it probably had north of 40 parking units on it. And that would be a lot of parking. And that parking has been utilized by the restaurant to make a living for many years. Madam Chair, I think um, the Freeman family did not articulate their issue was parking until just now. They, they had a lot of other they had a general issue with the disposition and their losing of a lawsuit. And they were not articulate about uh, exactly what they were looking for 
otherwise, because uh, Mr. Bell actually met with the Freemans quite a few times and they never articulated that. So we're trying to work and figure out. I'm not sure I was not at the meeting yesterday. I'm not sure if they defined exactly um, how many cars, but since the meeting was only yesterday, we're trying to, to work together to figure that out. Uh, and we respect that. Um, and, um, and that's, that's the approach we're going to try and take, but, um, we're, unfortunately it, it came up in, in technical detail just before, uh, this hearing. So. Okay. Councilman McCormick, I'm going to let you in and then I've got a, a couple of other questions. No. So I just want to speak to the fact that the, the, the family, um, uh, in coming to a conclusion yesterday, while it was proposed yesterday about the parking, that actually was a, um, a result of uh, so much negotiation and them getting to a place where, you know what, forget everything else that was on the table. How about if we propose this? So there have been so many iterations of trying to work something out. So what that represented yesterday and, and why that was proposed yesterday, uh, it was a commitment from the, free, from the Freeman families to wanna to be a part of this development and move forward as opposed to being you know, any obstructionist or anything, and I'm not saying that they would have done that, but this represented them saying, hey, here's, what, here's our last dish effort to try and work together. Can you just please protect the parking so that my business doesn't continue to suffer? There have been several other proposals prior to that. This one just was really just cut to the heart of them being able to continue to do business and their business not be impeded, which is really a, 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 a kind of crazy negotiation to have to do to get down to the fact that just please help me protect and save uh, the sanctity of my business and my ability to do business. But this was after, just for the record, this was after so many different ideas and proposals. This was them just saying, all right, finally, if you'll just help me save my business, basically. You should mention the bike lane, Rob, because that's a special design. Yeah powerful right right so so the reality was that the the, the uh, part of the spaces were taken due to us being progressive in the community and providing uh, a safe uh, ability to travel by bike which I do everybody knows that it's no big secret right so 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 here we go again having to sit juxtapose uh, from parking to to, to safe uh, bike lanes to supporting small business to and, and I believe, and Gordon and I had conversations into the night about the fact that we can do all of these things simultaneously. We can provide, we're in the city of New York for Christ's sakes, if we can't come up with a way to satisfy all of these needs and not make them competing, I don't know who can. So providing safe passage and having safe bike lanes, which myself and my family use, that's a great idea. It moved our city, it reduces our carbon footprint, it allows us to be progressive as a community, but do we have to need the Freeman, like we need the Freemans directly in, in the groin in doing that because those parking spaces were removed, right? So, uh, and I don't think the Freemans would say, hey, we don't want safe, you know, uh, uh, people to be safe in, trans in, 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 in transversing around the district. So that's four competing, four things that we've made competing interests when they shouldn't be, it should be inclusive in a real plan to move forward as a community. So we should have parking for our commercial businesses. And it's not just them, there's other commercial businesses ancillary to that, um, uh, to that corridor who would also benefit. Uh, just for the record, I forgot, Gordon, and I'm sorry to bring this up now, but did we, we, did we, we put the select bus in on Nostrand Avenue. Yes, yes. It took away more parking space. Right. So in a different, in, a, in the ability, like I can't believe that we can't sit together and go, okay, select buses, that takes away parking spaces. And it, 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 the ability for them to do business along Nostrand Avenue to have trucks wait to unload and load with the, with, it, it was, it's, just, it's just crazy. And I think we as a city look crazy. So this is, a, this is an opportunity for us to pivot and shift, which is what we're saying we're gonna do and provide all of those needs uh, for the small businesses, for our people who wanna stay here and have affordable rents, for people who wanna use our streets uh, to bike safely. Um, I think, we, I think uh, Gordon and I agree that we could do all of that. Yeah, and this is Sarah Mallory. If we, if we spend our political capital, and I'm willing to spend mine, so. And this is Sarah Mallory from HPD. Just wanted to say thank you for joining that call last night with our colleagues at City Hall. Obviously, HPD is focused on the housing component, but this 
as you have said, uh, transcend spaces. And so we are happy to continue those conversations and look forward to doing so. Okay, that, that clarifies a little bit because I know that the community board disapproved um, the project um, by a small scale. I was just, I was trying to understand all of the, uh, the nuances with this because to me, this, as far as the project itself, you know, as Councilmember Carnegie said, this is a dream. Um, you know, it's what everybody wants, you know, uh, truthfully, everybody wants something like this. Um, so now I, I understand the nuances. I understand, uh, you know, the legacy now um, with um, the Freeman family and, and especially the parking, which is a thorn in the side, I think of everybody in every borough right about now. Um, I've got a question for for HPD though, um, the project um, developed under the Ella term sheet, um, which facilitates development at a range from 30 to 80 AMI, what are the likely tiers in the final project? I don't think we saw that in the presentation. Sure. Yep, so at this point, and Lynn, feel free to jump in here. Um, we currently have roughly a tiers between 30% and 80% AMI and are coming back with the details on the number of units that are between those. Okay, so we don't, uh, that would have been my next question. We don't know the mix as far as unit sizes. Yeah, Lynn, can you correct me on that one, please? Yeah, I mean, I think generally the for our Ella term sheets, um, we try to have four tiers um, and that is still, probably needs to be worked out with the development team. Um, so right now we don't have um, the exact tiers, but I, I, the development team definitely has, a, you know, the type of affordability that they want to hit with this project, especially with the lower AMIs, um, but the exact tiers we do not have right now. We will, I, I believe we're going we're to end up having uh, about 15% of the units for the formerly homeless as per the city council's um, directive. And then we will have a distribution in the 40%, 50%, um, probably a, a few at 60, and then just below 80% AMI. There will be uh, num units of all sizes in each tier. Um, but I couldn't tell you right now, it's probably going to be, we're hoping, um, well, uh, to be candid, because of the financial underwriting and the lack of support by the by Washington DC, we're still working on the final details of, of what amount of uh, unit sizes in each group. And, and that's to be worked out with the city um, as we go forward. Do we know who the um, administering agent for, uh, for affordable housing, who that's going to be? That would be St. Nick's Alliance. We're a not-for-profit. We do actually administrative agent for numerous uh, mixed income uh, for-profit owners. And we would continue. The building will be owned by uh, a collaboration, a joint venture of bed Restoration and St. Nick's. But St. Nick's Alliance would be the administrative agent and do the income verification uh, with the participation of bed Restoration. The okay. record have worked successfully together before, and this is a continuation of a partnership with HPD and St. Nick's for all of us parties, and, and with Rob's approval for that matter. So we are we are not a new collaboration. Okay, great. And will the affordable housing be permanent? Um, what's the length of the regulatory agreement? Anyone? No? Um, yes, I, I believe um, for most of our Ella deals, um, start off uh, 30 years and, and at the end of 30 years, and you know, an opportunity to extend that affordability for another 30 years. And, and for the record, restoration is always seeking permanent affordability. So it is our intention stated and has been our history that we re-up the affordability and sign a new regulatory agreement. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna stop there for a minute and 
see if my colleagues have any questions at this point, and I may come back around. Um, Madam Chair, Council Member Barron has her hand up. She has a question. Okay, Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the uh, panel for coming and presenting data about this project. And I heard Mr. Bell say that in bed there's been a lack, uh, there's been a loss of, I think he said 48% of the black population. And I think that's directly attributable to the fact that often HPD offers projects that they call affordable, which go as high as 130%, 120% of the AMI, which I think is disingenuous and misleading. So I'm pleased to see that this project is going to be capped at 80% of the AMI, which is still above the neighborhood median income, but at least it's capped at 80%. And I commend the developers for that. Uh, Madam Chair asked the question that I was going to ask. I want to see the percentages at each of the AMIs that you are targeting for uh, the residents that are going to be living in this building. I want to know exactly what you are targeting at each of the AMIs that you are projecting. Because certainly if we have it top heavy at 80% of the AMI, we're falling into that same trap again and losing those who whose incomes do not allow them to qualify because they are not as high as what would be offered. And the other question that I had also was asked about by the chair in terms of the terms of affordability, but in terms of the project itself, what's the cost of this project? Philip, do you know the, uh, is it? Yep, I'm looking at right now. So like, like right now, like, you know, Everybody our preliminary numbers is about, um, it's like a, uh, about $47 TDC. Say again, I didn't hear you. It's about $50 million in TDC. Okay. And TDC is a total development cost. Yes, sorry right. about that. Hard cost right. and soft right. cost, yes. Right. Okay, well, I look forward to uh, some resolution regarding the parking with the Freeman family. And I also look forward to the precise percentages at each of the tiers that are targeted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Council, are there any other questions? Before I go back in, I've got one more, but I'll make sure that my colleagues get their questions answered. Uh, no hands up at this time, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. May we address the question of committing to tiers? Absolutely. So the deal team had proposed um, a definitive list of homeless and we started off at nine, 10% and have gone to 15%, which is the low tier, Council Member Barron. And we are happy to do that. And that, that rent translates into something the communities understand. Communities don't wanna hear about 30%, 50%, 70%. Communities wanna hear about $575 as rent or $1,000 as rent. Because traditionally in Bed-Stuy, the affordable units are in the $800 to $1,500 range. We need to honor that and we have, we have really stride striving to do that. The, um, the, the unclarity comes in trying to conform to the government stipulations, not from the deal team. So if we had a complete layout, we could make it work if we knew how we were being subsidized and sponsored. We started off having a preliminary and we have been awaiting finalization from the government agencies. It's not our, it's not our hesitancy to commit to the lower levels. We've increased our commitment to the lower levels. We like it and we think it's important. Second note, in Bed-Stuy, you have everyone from the Bed-Stuy brownstoners, folks who've owned their own properties for many years, all the way to folks who live in housing projects. So we want to stand with Councilman Cornegy and in understanding that we need to provide all kinds of affordable housing. But the low end is often forgotten in this situation, partly because the cost of construction is relatively high and it's easier to make the underwriting work by charging the higher rents. So we want to continue with the lower end and the medium end and the high end of affordability to serve the community. And again, they don't think of it as in percentages of AMI. People don't walk around saying, I make X percent of AMI. They say, I can afford about 1200 bucks for my family to live. Can I find that in bed -Stuy?
Thank you, Mr. Bell. Mr. Uh, Adams, uh, Council Member Barron has her hand up. Yes, go ahead, Council. Thank you. Uh, I, I thank you for that and I appreciate that. Yes, it's true that those who are in the community perhaps don't even know what AMI stands for. But those of us who are setting the policy know that the feds set those standards without regard to looking at neighborhood median incomes. So we've got to be uh, the adversaries, no, the advocates is the word I want for those in the community who won't even be able to qualify because they are not at the required AMI, even though they may be struggling to get the money to make the rentals. So certainly we appreciate that. And also we wanna acknowledge that, um, yes, we wanna have uh, a spectrum, but we don't want to disenfranchise or disqualify those who are at the lower levels, who are in the greater numbers. If you look at the AMIs at each of those percentages in that community who are greater numbers than those who let's say are at the upper levels with the brown stoners. Look at the percentages for each of the AMIs in the district. And certainly that can be a guide and a target for how we do the distribution within a range above and below. But certainly looking at the neighborhood median income, which I believe is about $40,000 in bed -Stuy. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Barron. I wanted to uh, just ask, uh, my final question had to do with um, Passive House uh, Green Building Standards. I'm curious to find out about that. I understand that the two larger buildings are being developed under Passive House um, uh, Green Building Standards. Whenever I hear Green Building Standards, something goes up, the antenna goes up. So let's hear a little bit more, more about that. Tell us what Passive House is and why we don't see more of this going on in HPD development. Sure, Bill, you, you reflect the comments of our architect and our work? Yeah, and I, you know, I can kind of speak, you know, just in terms of like how we presented it in terms of sort of passive house component. Well, this is our pretty much for St. Nick's and restoration, our first passive house. Um, it, it is really, um, a, an ultra insulated building, um, you know, ultra site that allows for greater comfort in the building. It allows for the, um, the tenant to be able to you utilize um, reduced um, utilities, um, um, you know, uh, under heating so that um, it brings down costs and at the same time um, is willing in terms of saving in terms of the CO submission, um, 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 CO, um, CO um, outtake. So um, the other component is the mechanical systems are much more efficient so that it, um, you know, on a traditional system, this system is going to output, you know, half of what these uh, older systems do. So it's saving the, um, the building money it's saving the tenant money and it's saving the owner money. And at the same time, saving, um, you know, meeting the green goals of New York and, you know, the United States in terms of its CEO output. And thank you, my apologies for the delay. I was trying to unmute myself in order to speak. Um, but HPD also does environmental reviews in conformance with kind of federal state and city regulations and works with development teams to encourage um, either passive house or other types of green building standings to promote energy efficiency in all of our buildings. That is great. Um, I, I really want us to look forward and, and uh, look at doing more of this, Sarah. This is good. Um, like I said, Councilmember Carnegie, this gets better and better. Um, so we're gonna have to do whatever we can to get that parking situation squared away because we want more of this. Um, all right, are there any more questions from my colleagues at this point? Uh, I don't see any other questions from council members. Okay. I think we had a question from the gallery. Are we excusing the panel?
Uh, is anybody else from the applicant team? Um, can you raise your hand if you have something else you would like to say? I don't see any other hands up from the applicant's team. Okay. There being no further questions for the panel, the panel is excused. Thank you so much. Thank you, panel. Uh, council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Yes, we have, um, I see two members of the public who signed up to testify, um, Theo Chino and Akisha Freeman. So if we can promote them and unmute them, we'll start with um, Theo Chino. Hello, Sir Adam. Um, this is Theo Chino. We, Mr. I have Chino, Mr. Chino, hold on, please. We haven't started a clock yet. I'll be on the two minutes with a we clock or to, without. We need to do that. So please don't begin until the Sergeant at Arms has announced that your time has started. Very well. Thank you for being here. I would not, I prefer not to be here, but I will be here. Sergeant at Arms, have you announced the time? Just give him one second. Time begins now. You may begin, Mr. Chino. Thank you, Ms. Adam. Uh, Chair Adam. Okay, I'm calling because I'm asking you to vote no until there is an HPD investigation in every corruption that is happening. This is the kind of project that end up where I live at 640 Riverside Drive. I've talked about it. And what I just heard from, from the chairman of the housing, Mr. Carnegie, uphold me when the familiarity of, oh, Rob, or oh, this, or we need to, I spend all night working on the parking. This is exactly the corruption I'm talking about. When did a business become more important than the people living in New York City? When did the parking spot become more important than a project? So the project and all those nonprofits, like the one that is doing this project, need to be investigated from bottom to top by the DOI and HPD. I has asked you, I sent a letter to Councilman Barron from the Afro-Socialist Resolution asking for that investigation. It's an upfront to all the people from the Black Panther and all the socialists that have fought for this city. And it is an affront that nobody's doing anything. So now it's over, I am tired, I am done. So Chair, Chairwoman Adam, with all the due respect, politics is over. I built Red My Block to find 70,000 people to replace all of you at city council because I keep talking, I keep talking, I keep talking and testifying and nothing is done. So I'm done talking. I will come over. I ask you to vote no. You still vote yes. You st I ask you to do an investigation. You don't do it. I ask to look at how the lottery system is done. You don't do it. And Chairman, Adams, I would like you to unblock me on Twitter because I am sending now uh, a complaint, a legal complaint for you to unblock me at the federal court. So thank you very much for your time, but I am done dealing with the corruption of the city council. You're doing you very everything. Much. Time has expired. Chair Adams, the next speaker is Akisha Freeman. Time begins now. Ms. Freeman, welcome. You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Robert Carnegie. On behalf of my family, I'm here with my father. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Um, we're just trying to work out a deal, as Robert stated before. Um, yes, we did come to the table with certain things that we wanted that were supposed to be fair to my father being a proprietor in, of this business and a pillar in the community. Um, and he has something to say in regards to that. So we're basically trying to meet them halfway with this project. Yes, we are. Um, we, are in, we are definitely in agreement of what the housing struggles are in New York, but we're also in agreement with our business struggles. So as Robert said, there shouldn't be one over the other that has to compete, but there should be a meet in the middle. And here's my father. He just wants to say a few words. Okay, I would like to have two minutes myself. My name is Eddie Freeman. I've been here in Bedford-Stuyvesant for 73 years. I ran this business here 
for 41 years as of today. I have an agreement with HVD. I had all the variants changed. I, I, I did everything that HVD asked me to do. They asked me to put uh, up a fence to secure the property. They asked me to clean the property off because there was like 100 parking cars there when I got it. I put up a 10 feet wall all the way around the building. I, and I put it in a four foot footing. So actually a 14 feet of wall. I paid for that myself. I have everything, the agreement with HBD. As soon as 643 is Eula, they were gonna turn that property over and put it in my name. They have not did it yet. And the Eula, I had the variance change in 1997. So that, and it was approved for parking. So when they say we just started, we've been working on this since 1995. So 1997, we had with our director street, for the director street, we had everything fixed. Time so we just been waiting. I'm sorry, go ahead. You can continue, Mr. Freeman. Okay. So we've been waiting for them to yearly that one piece of property so I could turn it into parking for Sugar Hill Restaurant. And it's been over since not over 23 years. Each administration come in with something different. I have in writing what HBD has promised me mm -hmm. and everything. I talked to the, uh, I have everything in writing. So I just want to hold HBD accountable to what they have promised me and all the money I've spent on this property, all the insurance I put. And uh, I work for the federal government. My ex-wife worked 48 years with the federal government. So we're not just uh, uh, somebody that just looking for property. This has been a business that I've supported. This is where Hillary Clinton got us start. This is where uh, uh, the guy in 1988, he ran for president. Uh, Jesse Jackson got his start. This is where Marty Marcus got his start. I'm a community person and I put all my money into this property and at the nights when I couldn't sleep that this has messed with my health. So I'm asking you all to, to hold HPD accountable for what they have in writing for Sugar Hill. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very much. Thank you both for being here today. We really appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Council, were there any uh, questions from my colleagues for, for these witnesses at all? Uh, there are no council member questions at this time. Okay, are there any other members of the public wishing to testify on this item at this time? Um, if there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the CAB Commons project, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will stand at ease while we check for members of the public. Chair Adams, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, thank you. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify today, today's public hearing is now closed and this item is laid over. The vote on LU 691 is now closed as well as that vote is concluded and that does conclude today's business. I remind you that if you have written testimony on today's item, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or the project name in the subject heading. I'd like to thank the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, subcommittee council, of course, land use staff and the sergeants at arms for participating in today's hearings. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you.